Daniel, thank you for making the time to speak to me. I know it's really late over there. And we're going to do a follow-up to, we did a situational assessment a little while ago about COVID, where we're at, what the sort of second and third order effects might be that we're seeing. And just to introduce you briefly to people who maybe are not familiar with you, uh, you've been on the channel quite a bit uh, with films like The War on Sense Making. You're really interested and spend a long time studying uh, catastrophic risk and sort of civilization design. And I'd love to hear from you, like where do you think we're at right now? And so probably a lot of the viewers here have heard the term the hammer and dance. I think uh, Poyo kind of popularized it. I don't know if he came up with it. And that there is uh, an approach that most countries have taken of some kind of strong quarantine for a while to stop the transmission and then a release of that quarantine. But that doesn't mean back to life as normal instantly because there are still going to be infected people and it could re uh, start if there wasn't carefulness. So there has to be some ongoing management that will involve some social distancing and PPE and testing and contact tracing and all these kinds of things. And some areas that have already uh, got the caseload down quite a lot and started to open back up did start to see upticks in the number of cases again. So then you have to kind of restrict again, and that's the dance, right? <clears throat> and so um, most of the principles that I share will be pretty universal to anywhere because it's universal to public health and epidemiology and like that. But um, I'll speak about them in context of the United States in particular, since a lot of viewers are there and I know more about there than other places being based here. Um, so we didn't have nationwide uh, shelter in place in a way that some people were concerned about and some people really wanted, but for whatever, we didn't have that. We more had state-based approaches. and uh, But most of the states took some kind of measures to uh, shelter in place and only have essential workers out and things like that. Some states like California did a lot stronger measures earlier than other states and resultantly were able to have um, what looked like much better curves relative to the rest of the other metrics than what they could have. Um, we're seeing what looks like the beginning of a flattening, but it's not long enough to really have a clear sense on that. And you're supposed to see a flattening as a re meaning a decrease in the number of new cases. Um, as a result of those efforts, but that doesn't mean that it's, we, it's done and you release the efforts and it's gone, right? It means you release the efforts and the, you're back to the situation where it was on an exponential curve before. Um, and because of the lag time and call it two weeks, right? A couple five day doubling times or so, um, you really have to see it turn down for a little while before you actually have a clear sense of what has happened. But let's just kind of fast forward a little bit. And different countries are obviously at different places in their curve with regard to this. And even within the US, uh, some states got heavy amounts of infections much earlier than other states. Um, and then some of them started their shelter in place protocols earlier. And so this, it's not a universal curve. And for that reason, it's actually really good for individual cities and individual states to be able to think about it in a way that is uh, relevant to their case. At the same time, there's also big limits there. So let's say a state did a very good job of getting their case load down to almost nothing. Well, now they, but other states didn't, they have to keep their borders totally closed to um, transport of goods and to food and to whatever, otherwise they lose it again. And so there is a place where, whether we're talking from a state by state or a county by county or a country by country level, to reopen up the flow of traffic, which is key for the economy and society, everybody kind of has to get to a similar place. So there, there are both benefits of regionalism and limits to it for a situation like this. So with regard to, uh, looking ahead a little bit and what does the path of starting to release the shelter in place or quarantine look like that will be effective at being able to uh, keep 
suppressing the virus, keep that from being a public health pandemic while being able to allow societal function and economy and everything to return. Um, I'll share some thoughts on that, some of which are obvious and are publicly talked about, some of which are not as obvious. And hopefully in this first bit, sharing this all together will add some clarity. This is the day after Easter and uh, much of this might change by a week from now because it is a situation where a lot is still unknown and we're learning a lot quickly. Um, and I might be wrong about some things, so take it all with a grain of salt. Um, so the first thing is, when do we actually start releasing the quarantine measures? Different states have very different perspectives on this. Um, and uh, around the country, there's pretty different perspectives all the way from the beginning of, you know, say, Sweden on one side to Hong Kong on another in terms of how to approach this. Um, and you can really see a difference in CFR and things like that as a, as a function of some of those approaches. As soon as the curve starts to go down a little bit is not the time that you start to release the shelter in place, which is the only thing that's keeping it down. You actually need to get down to a relatively small number of total cases within a region. And a region means the area in which there is a uh, possibility for transmission. So let's say a city or a metropolitan area. Um, you want to get down to a low total number of cases in that area before you start relaxing the uh, shelter in place or quarantine more. Otherwise, you're going to still get an uptick pretty quickly. We've seen this happen in a number of areas. You also shouldn't think about releasing it um, universally meaning we already have a situation of essential workers who aren't on quarantine or aren't on shelter in place because for everyone else to be able to be at home, the utilities still have to be on and farmers still have to be doing agricultural work and grocery stores and uh, frontline workers and all like that. So there will be an increase in the kinds of essential services that can start to turn on while still being able to protect more vulnerable populations as a first step. So the most vulnerable populations, call it nursing homes and elderly care facilities and places where there are people who are immunocompromised, and uh, those places should stay on stricter protocols for a longer period of time. And there are some people who have been calling anyways for let everybody who is younger and healthy not be on quarantine at all and just protect the vulnerable populations. Um, it's not a good idea to do that. I wouldn't suggest it's a good idea, 50 percent of the people in Italy who are on ventilators were under 60. And a lot of people get very serious cases. Definitely people die who are young and healthy people. But even the people who don't die, because a lot of the people who get severe illness right now who are younger don't die, but that doesn't mean that there isn't lasting damage for them. So there are uh, signs of many of the people who got to severe illness who are coming out who have uh, fibrosis in the lungs, cardiomyopathy, damage, renal damage to, uh, you know, kidneys. And so we shouldn't only be thinking about, uh, did they die or not? We should also be thinking about obviously not just how bad a two months was that for them, um, and the hospital bills and the overwhelm of the ICUs and the, all like that that's associated, but also the lifelong consequences that, uh, can be had from getting into advanced stage. Also, it's much harder to protect the vulnerable populations when much higher numbers of people have it because there is cross-contamination. Um, so the first strategic objective, and we talked about it last time, was make sure that the total number of cases doesn't exceed the capacity of the ICUs in the various cities. We saw what happened in Italy when the ICU capacity was exceeded and there weren't enough ventilators and there wasn't enough treatment options for people and case fatality rate jumps very, very sharply. We still could have a situation where we mismanage this and that happens, but for the most part, we've been right at ICU capacity in some of the worst hit areas uh, like New York and New Jersey, but we haven't been in a, having to decide if we have ventilators or ICU beds as much. Um, so we do need to keep this situation of 
making sure that the total number of cases is within the capacity of the ICUs and also factoring the fatigue of the frontline workers, which is a really significant thing. Probably everybody has watched plenty of videos of nurses and doctors now who are in some of the more intense fire zone areas talking about their experience. But um, yeah, New York has something like 80% of the people who get put on ventilators come off dead. And we can talk about that because it I think there are treatment approaches that are much better than ventilators that um, should be uh, explored. But you can just imagine if you were a nurse working in a place and doing all the work to ventilate someone and hope and taking 80% of the people that you're putting on and caring for off dead and just what that's like. Um, there's only so long that those people can do that also as they have increased um, disease exposure themselves. So when we think about the things that we can do uh, that are relevant to mitigate the disease, let's think about the first part being how do we decrease the total number of infections? The second part being how do we decrease the percentage of the infections that become severe? And the third part being how do we make sure that there is enough treatment and ICU capacity that wherever there are severe infections are able to be well treated? Um, this last step is how is getting increased PPE to the hospitals, increased um, drugs and uh, diagnostic tests and things that have been rate limited to some degree, ventilators, ICU beds, whatever. And so there's a lot of kind of logistics supply chain that has been both super inspiring in the goodness of people's work and super disheartening in the poorness of the logistics, especially, you know, federally sponsored, supported logistics to get those things um, but that's coming along. Most of the focus is on the non-pharmaceutical interventions that can happen to kind of keep the transmission rate or the r naught rate down. And uh, so I'll speak about that a little bit. When the cases in an area are low enough to start releasing the shelter-in-place provisions, one of the most important things is that when people are going back to work and daily activity, that they continue social distancing for some period of time as a general practice and specifically the wearing of masks. This is something that the Czech Republic got really exemplary um, and has had a very low uh, CFR and a very good overall curve that they attribute very much to the mask policy. Um, just to clarify, because there are still some people who have confusion about the effectiveness of wearing masks and some of the major health organizations put out information that's conflicting to what we know now early in the process. Um, the main reason to wear a mask is not to prevent you from getting the illness, but to prevent you from spreading it. And the main thing that keeps you from getting it is other people wearing the mask. So that was the thing that the Czech Republic did was this commercial and this whole kind of mimetic campaign of I protect you, you protect me, which is really nice kind of campaign. And that's because even if I have a crappy mask, I've got just a t-shirt, right? If I sneeze, that's still going to block m most of the droplets and kind of larger particles from going and getting, becoming aerosolized, getting in the air, getting on surfaces. If I cough, it's going to stop them from doing that. And so the main purpose of the mask wearing is actually to keep the viral load in the air and on the surfaces very low. So the space is safe for other people on the surfaces. Uh, space safe for other people in the space. Now, it is also true that wearing PPE protects the wearer. Not perfectly. If you want perfect protection, you've got to get in an Ebola suit. And an Ebola suit used properly is pretty close to perfect protection. And you can think about like then, you know, a full face shield and personally powered respirator is not quite as good as an Ebola suit, but it's pretty, pretty good. And then even just a face shield and gown and whatever's pretty good. Um, but we don't have exact stats on this because it's not really an ethical study to try and expose people with different types of masks to different levels of viral load and see how much they get sick. But the estimate is something in the vicinity of if someone's wearing an N95, they're about five times less likely to get sick from the same exposure as someone who's not wearing a mask. That's pretty significant, right? A fifth of the likelihood is pretty significant. And uh, even a surgical mask is not going to be what an N95 is, but it'll be a significant reduction, especially if you know how to use it properly. So going to YouTube and looking at how to use PPE videos is important 
because if a mask's effective, what it means <laughs> effective for protecting you is that the outside of it might have viral particles on it. So if you come inside and then touch it with the outside, the outside of it with your hands and then don't wash your hands, obviously you kind of violated the process. So there's a whole process for just understanding how to, uh, how to utilize gloves and masks and things like that, how to sterilize the packages when they come to your house or when you're bringing food and groceries home. Uh, all of that is called, uh, can be called aseptic method, right? Or basically just kind of advanced hygiene. Everybody's getting some lessons in advanced hygiene right now. Uh, somebody on one of the projects we're working on just wrote up a good article on aseptic method, and I can send it to you so you can link it in here. So anybody who wants to study it will have that as a resource. Um, and this is going to be a huge part of it, is the mask wearing and the actual hygiene and aseptic practices, uh, which will keep viral load down tremendously relative and viral transmission down tremendously. We should also have something, of course, that like when stores start opening up, besides requiring people to have masks to come in, uh, that hand sanitizers out front of every place, uh, out front of banks, out front of supermarkets, et cetera, and that that's just a part of culture for some period of time. Um, because even if someone has a mask, they might have been under the mask scratching and then they're going and touching surfaces in the store. So the, the consciousness around that, part of the aseptic technique is don't do that, but also the sanitizer. Um, in addition to these things, one of the areas that I think is going to be hugely important and is least well talked about is the industrial hygiene or the environmental technologies. And this is how can we actually employ technologies and spaces that take virus out of the air and kill it on surfaces or bind it on surfaces so that even if there was the same amount of transmission going into the space, there's less transmissibility happening in the space as a result of the technologies happening in the space. So um, this is not stuff that we don't know how to do. When you look at how a clean room works, where you're experimenting with microbes and you have to make sure that they say say a bioweapons laboratory, for instance. Uh, how to sterilize the space is something that is pretty well known and there's a lot of off the shelf kinds of technologies. And there are some things that are really cheap and easy, some things that are a little bit more advanced, but really cheap and easy is like, when the doctors wear a face shield, the face shield makes a difference, right? Because we're there's viral shedding in people's exhale. Um, and so the face shield just has a literal physical barrier beyond just the mask, keeping it off their face, off their eyes, makes a difference. So right now in grocery stores, where people are still going to grocery stores and the grocery store workers have exposure to more people than almost anyone has right now, there should just be a piece of plexiglass between the grocery store worker, uh, between the person at the checkout and everybody who's coming through, just like there is at banks sometimes. That's a really cheap, easy solution that can be put in all those places with a few screws. And in addition to the PPE on both sides, you can sterilize that a number of times a day, um, will decrease transmission pretty significantly. So there's a lot of kind of pieces of environmental tech like that. Uh, most people probably saw the videos of when Wuhan was on lockdown, the massive disinfectant spraying in the streets. Drones were spraying and these huge trucks were spraying and like they were taking... They were taking sanitizing the environment very seriously, right? Um, we haven't seen a similar level of effort like that happen anywhere else, but we also didn't see a curve come down as intensely anywhere else. Now, that was for a number of reasons. They they had a very big explosion at the, being at the epicenter of it, but then they did very intensive methods to address it. Um, one research project that we brought together is a group of people who have background in... Uh, chemical and physical engineering, these types of topics who are looking in all the different air filtration methods. So HEPA filters and PECO filters and ionization and those types of things that can actually take the uh, virus out of the air, either break it down or bind it or both. Um, and then things like UV lights, there are specific frequencies of uh, even visible light that look effective in the blue range. And um, microwave and acoustics that all kill the virus. Some of these are safe to do when humans are in the room. Some aren't. They'd have to be done sanitizing in between. 
there's obviously basic stuff like being able to sanitize and reuse PPE, um, then sanitizing medical environments, but also just lots of other environments, like all of the fruits and vegetables that are being handled by all of the workers. What can we do, not just when someone brings it home to be able to clean them properly, but what can we put in the grocery stores to be able to decrease the transmission in grocery stores? So uh, for instance, ozone gas happens to be very virucidal, dissipates quite quickly. So when the store closes at night, could it have ozone gas uh, going over the produce section or over other areas? There's other gases. There's other things that can be nebulized, nebulized hydrogen peroxide. So we're looking into these types of environmental solutions. There's also, in addition to like surface disinfectants, there are a few companies claiming to have surface treatments that can not just disinfect but be able to actually bind viruses on the surface for some period of time. And we haven't been able to verify those claims yet. We're in the process, but that'd be pretty awesome and make a huge difference. So the first place we really want to see these uh, right away and working on getting a proposal together in the next week for it is um, obviously hospitals and ICUs because it's the place where R-naught is the highest right now. It's the place where there's the most total transmission because it's where you have the most sick people with the most severe sickness. Most severe sickness means coughing the most and the highest level of viral load. Um, I can't give any quantitative numbers because I don't believe they exist yet, but it does seem uh, most likely that the total level of viral load of exposure makes a difference to how likely someone is to get sick at all and the severity of the sickness. And so it's not simply, are you exposed to virus, but are you exposed to a million viral particles or a few viral particles? It's going to be very different in terms of the immune system's capacity to be able to respond to it. And so these types of technologies could take down the viral load in the environments enough, and especially in the environments where people can't stop interacting, uh, that any that a lot of people just aren't exposed at all, and any exposures are very low viral load exposures, which means and which might actually even end up meaning that people produce an antibody response without getting severe illness. Premature to know for sure, but things that are being explored. Um, so in addition to inside of hospitals and ICUs for the environmental tech and then grocery stores, um, prisons, and police stations and fire departments and all of the places where there's humans in close interaction with each other where they can't do social distancing. And as a result, if anyone gets it and is asymptomatic, can transmit to lots of people. In addition to hand sanitizing and wearing masks and those types of things, we want to really look at employing the environmental tech. And this will also be relevant with if there are follow-up mutations and it's infrastructure that should stay in place for future epidemics and pandemics to be able to just make safer environments independent of, and in addition to the social engineering. The uh, social engineering just meaning human behavior, right? Having humans stay at home or social distance or modify their behavior with hand sanitizer. I have to be careful because some of the comments I've seen on these Rebel Wisdom uh, videos get pretty wild. So I say a term like social engineering and then pretty soon I'm an Illuminati member. Um, but, uh, so there's the environmental tech that can make spaces safer. And then there's the social tech, which is, um, like at ICUs, there should, this is happening in some places, but it's not happening in every place. In the places that it isn't, it really needs to shift that, uh, there has to be the ability to triage in the parking lot if people are COVID patients or not COVID patients, and then a COVID facility and a not COVID facility. The not COVID facility doesn't have doctors or nurses or hospital staff that are COVID positive, but asymptomatic allowed to work there. The doctors, in, which has been the case throughout most of the places in the U.S., which means that someone can go in and be more likely to get COVID at the hospital than almost anywhere else. Um, and let's say you've got some other health issue you're going in for, so you already are, you know, in the situation of uh, comorbidity, then that's the situation where you most don't want to get infections. So we want to have things like masks. Uh, everyone should have a mask before they leave their home, 
but let's say somebody messes up, there's extra masks out front at the hospital or emergency room or ICU they have to put on before they go inside, keep the space down. Um, if when people are signing in, they're touching something, then all of that needs to be sterilized between times that people are engaging with it. Uh, separating the COVID and the non-COVID people, super critical. So those are basically kind of logistical things. And then there's the environmental tech in those spaces. And the combo of being able to deploy things like the right kind of UV light to sterilize equipment and sterilize rooms, the right kind of uh, combo filtration method. So like something like a PECO filtration that can break the viruses down with something like a HEPA that can bind them with the right kinds of uh, disinfectants and surface treatments uh, really could make the spaces radically safer. And now then when we start to open back up widely and think about, think about like train stations and airports and the places with very, very high contact are the things that we can do. You think about like a TSA person who's sick, touching everybody's uh, passports and whatever, like the total amount of infectious transmission that could happen there is huge. And if anyone else was sick and giving them the thing, they they could get it, right, um, asymptomatically. So the little thing that they scan under that scans the barcode, could we add UV to it that also sterilizes? Just basic kinds of environmental tech that could make a pretty significant difference. Um, the other big thing, obviously, is diagnostics and contact tracing. And this is widely talked about. The types of diagnostics matter. And we see now the whole thing about like uh, 100 plus cases in South Korea that tested clear that are testing, tested having had coronavirus that they no longer had it and have it again, COVID-19 specifically. Um, and we're seeing that in other countries. There is this massive question of whether or not immunity is conferred and the nature of how it's conferred and how long it'll be conferred for and across what set of mutations. This is a super important question. Uh, I'll get back to why in a moment, but um, what is it, it? Is it that they really got better or was it the wrong kind of test uh, is a very important question because it's not like all the tests are the same. The tests are testing very different things. So uh, the antibody tests, there are some people, it appears, maybe almost up to 30% of the people who are, when using molecular methods, using PCR methods where we know that they have this virus, aren't producing meaningful antibodies. There's a big question of like, what's going on with that? Then there are some people who have antibodies where it's not clear that they actually ever had COVID-19. So there's a question of, did they have one of the four other coronaviruses that cause normal colds and that those antibodies are actually protective against this or in some cases. So what does an antibody test mean versus what, it, what do the actual uh, PCR tests mean? And if we're doing PCR on what fluids? So there's a big thing around being able to when someone has been sick, when do they get to come off quarantine? Well, they should come off quarantine when there's no more viral shedding, right? When their exhale doesn't have viruses anymore and their feces doesn't have viruses. Um, and so rather than just a period of time or lack of symptomology, it should be testing based, but that requires the right types of tests. More importantly is early on in the process, we wanna be able to test and if someone has been exposed, we want to be able to know as close to when they got exposed as possible, not days later. If we're testing for antibodies, it takes many days for it to go from landing on the mouth or landing in the nose to go through the mucosal immune system into the blood, produce an antibody response. Um, and depending upon the sensitivity of the PCR technique, even if we're doing nasal swabs, if there's a small number of viral particles, will it be able to catch it or does it have to wait for a lot of viral replication? Because if we're rolling out tests, but someone has to have been exposed three days before, which means people are showing up clear, but they're not just because of the earliness of false negatives, that's not very effective. So the kinds of tests that can be very high sensitivity uh, can pick up small total viral count ideally be quantitative, very fast turnaround times, um, super important. So we, we've we looked at uh, the different types of tests and companies that are out there to be able to help with a suite of things that can meet the kind of 
national objectives and beyond national. Uh, there happens to be one technology that's really asymmetrically further ahead than the rest of them that I'm trying to help quite a lot um, that I think is uh, going to be a major part of the infrastructure for how to do uh, pandemic preparedness in the future where we're able to identify and go into smart quarantine immediately and never have to go into totalized quarantine and all the damage that that causes. Um, contact tracing. Maybe of all the things I'd like the Rebel Wisdom people to know about and uh, pay attention to would be contact tracing. In order to have the testing be effective, you either have to test everybody all the time, right? Like test a very big percentage of the total population. And then if I test you today and you're negative, that doesn't mean anything about do you go and get exposed tomorrow. So um, you either need a pretty high penetration on testing, or you need some smart process to know who to test so that less total tests can still be effective. So the goal of contact tracing is if you get tested and it shows, oh, you are positive, that we can identify the people that you came in contact with over the period of time since you were probably exposed to get tests to them since they have higher likelihood. And so we're wanting to trace the contacts that you've had. Uh, this is something that I have been very concerned by because this has been enacted in a number of countries, Asian uh, countries first. And it is absolutely a kind of surveillance apparatus that I don't want states or companies to have. And I don't think anybody actually thinks it's a good idea if you really think about it. We've been dealing with the surveillance capitalism problems that are already like so excessive that it's it's very hard to see how we'll ever pull them back. Um, and surveillance state type issues from FISA Act on, right? Um, even before that. Uh, so how do we, and this whole thing of um, when things are bad enough that people will agree to civil liberty damaging things because they need to, the terrorism is dangerous enough, so Patriot or Homeland Security Act. This is obviously a very like historical process to be able to increase top-down control and power is have a situation that uh, justifies that. Um, Google and Apple just a couple days ago led the way in, well, lots of groups were working on contact tracing in a way of being able to roll it out since the two of them together is most of all cell phones. And they're definitely looking at privacy considerations, which is really good. Um, but getting the privacy considerations right is going to be really key. We do not want the info of everywhere that you went and everyone that you came in contact with and all the surfaces that you came in contact with that anybody else came in contact with as best can be identified. We don't want any company or the state to just have that access. We don't even want a central database that can be hacked or captured that has that access. So being able to do it in a decentralized database form that is not hackable or capturable uh, or generally surveillable, but still provides what is needed is super important. So there are methods where the info can be stored on the people's phones directly, Bluetooth mediated when they come within a Bluetooth proximity to each other. And then it's only unlocked if it finds out that you were sick. And then there were random numbers that were generated between you and the people you came in contact with, and it'll ping them. Hey, you were came in contact with someone who was sick, go get tested. Um, so making sure that the right privacy provisions are in place so that the solutions to this don't destroy civil liberties. We can see that in, I have a friend who works at a refugee camp in Uganda, and this has happened in other areas, but she was saying that uh, the quarantine was put in place for the people to stay in the refugee camp, but there's no food in the refugee camp. They would have to walk to like a UN facility that or somewhere like that that has food and they're not allowed to walk there. And so the people are dying of, or at risk of dying of starvation other than coronavirus. And we can see uh, uh, Duterte authorizing use of lethal force for police, for people violating quarantine in the Philippines. And so this descent into increased authoritarianism, like, is it a good idea? to have some process where we actually do close down the borders during a epidemic or pandemic. Yes, absolutely. 
and where we do some emergency provisions, like give doctors the ability to treat at discretion uh, more fully regarding their malpractice and like that based on emerging data before we have randomized control trials. Yes. But do we want to give provisions to the types of major power players, the, the, the players that have major asymmetric power that don't let asymmetric power go once they have it? No. So I think that's, and this is a place where I think people have been having a hard time is people who are very libertarian oriented and concerned with civil liberties and things like that. Many of them, not all, but many of them have been oriented towards a narrative that the virus isn't that bad and the whole thing is just a conspiracy to take away civil liberties and see these hospitals that don't have any people in them. Um, and there are hospitals that don't have any people in them because there are very bad logistics and routing issues in many of the cities and states where there are overwhelmed hospitals with other hospitals that don't have hardly anyone there and other hospitals that have been opened up to deal with this that weren't full yet. Um, and then there are other people who say, oh, well, the virus is so bad, we have to do whatever it takes and have a kind of naive positivity towards authorities and don't really uh, consider the surveillance issues. I would say both of those are off, naive. The virus is an issue, so is asymmetric power. Um, and uh, both should be paid attention to. So we have to get, um, we, do, we do need to do contact tracing, and we do have to do wide diagnostics as part of the recovery. Also, with regard to wide diagnostics, it's important that we do some random testing, not just people who are possibly sick, but random testing for the background epidemiology that helps us know how to solve this. But that doesn't, like, then there's a big question around, wait, does random mean that people have tests forced on them? Who forces the tests? Are we talking about doctors? Are we talking about police? So any model where police get, get to randomly stop people and forcibly medically test them, fuck no, that's a very bad idea but where medical doctors that are treating people for other stuff anyways um, add COVID tests to it, yeah, that's, that's a totally valid thing. Um, and so being very thoughtful of the types of uh, blowback negative effects of the provisions that we put in place and yet the need to put provisions in place and just making sure we're optimizing for both solving this problem and not causing other problems at the same time is a key consideration. One other thing I didn't say, and this should be happening already today before we even think about the dance phase, is so I was mentioning all of that was how do you decrease the total amount of transmission? But this other part is how do you make it to where uh, people who are infected, a smaller percentage of them have severe infections? That's a huge question, right? Now, there's stuff being explored regarding... Um, plasma transfer. So people who've recovered who have antibodies, can we take their plasma injected in other people either as a treatment and or as a prevention? It's interesting research, not far enough along to know, but like it's interesting. It appears that there might be some people who from having had previous coronaviruses recently might already have some background immunity and being able to identify that would be valuable. Um, but it's not known. <clears throat> There is some indication that there are more and less virulent strains of this virus, of SARS-CoV-2, and that there might be less virulent strains that people could be exposed to that wouldn't produce illness, but would still produce a protective antibody to the more virulent strains. So that's a very interesting kind of natural vaccine approach. Um, and, uh, you know, herd immunity advancement type approach. Um, but in addition to that, there's also treatments, right? Not just can we have antibodies, but are there antiviral and not just antiviral, but ACE2 modulating and cytokine modulating and other types of treatments. Um, we, there was so much talk about hydroxychloroquine because when Trump started talking about it, obviously got a lot of attention and it became a highly politicized topic. And then it wasn't about just doing medicine well. It was about, um, and, and you could see the biases, right? You could see 
people who just didn't want this to be that bad and wanted there to be an answer and so wanted to believe that there already was an answer. Um, and you could also see people who wanted Trump to be wrong and bad and stupid for having said something like that, given that he wasn't a doctor or a public health professional who kind of biased in another direction. And then they, of course, all read the data with that bias in mind. Um, so we tried to do a good literature review that looked at the whole history of this very old drug, hydroxychloroquine, by itself and in combination with azithromycin, doxycycline, zinc, other things. <clears throat> and what's known about it on previous coronaviruses, on previous SARS, in in vitro trials, in mechanistic insights, um, and in the kind of open label stuff that we have so far, given that we don't have the quality of randomized control trials that we'd normally want to see. Um, and what I will say about that is that it does not appear that it's particularly effective in late stage, but that's, that's to be guessed because very few antivirals are effective in late stage, right? It, it's generally the um, principle in m medicine and with infectious disease, and I'm, I'm not a PhD in infectious disease research or a medical doctor, so I'm just saying stuff here. Verify it yourself. Um, but if you have a herpes outbreak and you take a cyclovir within the first 24 hours, maybe up to 48 hours, it can be quite effective, and beyond that, it does almost nothing. And the same is true for shingles. And the same is true for when you start the HIV cocktail. Uh, can be very effective early on. It's not going to be very effective late. So the idea of authorizing treatment for late stage or doing a randomized control trial late stage doesn't really make much sense based on the whole body of what's known about antiviral treatments in general. Um, this is actually something I'm very concerned about, is if a randomized control trial is done on whether it's lopinavir or remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine or whatever, but let's say it's done on any antiviral late stage and we find that it's not successful compared to the placebo group. And then we overgeneralize that to say it's not successful. And as opposed to it's not successful late stage, we don't know anything about early stage if we didn't test it. And the most successful antivirals we have that work towards anything aren't successful late stage. That's just that's, we shouldn't be doing that study. That's a very dumb study. Now, of course, we would like to be able to treat late stage because there are some people who are there. So I don't mind a randomized control trial that does both early stage and late stage uh, in case we get lucky on late stage. But the precedent should be anything being studied should be looking at early stage treatment. Um, I do want to say something about the epistemics of randomized control trials, but I have a, a couple open loops here. The thing with regard to the hydroxychloroquine. So we want to see randomized control trials early stage. It will take a while for those to come out. Some of them are already in process. Some of them are nonsense and are only looking at late stage and aren't going to tell us anything that we don't already have a pretty good guess about. Um, but as it is, do we have enough insight that most every doctor who I've spoken with about this issue, who studied it well, has said, this is what I would use for myself and my family, even if I can't take that opinion, that position publicly, because it's not defensible traditionally yes, yet. Yes. I had some quite famous infectious disease docs say, this is, I already have it for myself. For And if any of me or my family get sick, this is what I'll do. But I can't um, talk about it publicly or say anything to that effect, because the hospital system that I work for said I'd lose my job. Um, I can't prescribe it to patients because the hospital system said that because they have been very trained with malpractice and other things to take maximally defensible positions. Uh, so what I think is that in the hydroxychloroquine is interesting because it's generic, so nobody can make all that much money on it because anybody can make it, right? It's off patent now. So... Um, since any company can make it, they're just competing on the margins of being able to, you know, produce the goods slightly cheaper. Uh, real money is made for things that are still on patent. So if someone, if we were wanting to look at kind of predatory, uh, perverse incentive, it would most likely be to prove that the generic things don't work to motivate the movement of drugs that actually have more money to be made. 
And there's been some interesting traction, not just with hydroxychloroquine, but also uh, ivermectin and methylene blue, which are all super old, very well-known anti-malarial drugs that have some antiviral and other kinds of activity. I'm very interested in the research on these drugs and other things like them, where we have 40 or 50 or 70 years of use on these, because it means that we have very long-term safety data already established. We know what the contraindications are. We know what the safety is. And there really aren't any financial motives that are associated. So all we have to do is show efficacy. We don't have to do long-term safety. So I'm happy to rush randomized control trials if need be in a situation like an epidemic on something where long-term safety is already established in other contexts. And all we're doing is establishing efficacy in a new context. I would not be happy to rush a new drug. It's a totally novel chemical, and we don't know anything about its established safety. And I certainly would not be happy to rush a new vaccine, which is intended to have enduring effects. So the, like, the epistemics that are needed for something new where we haven't established safety, randomized control trials, are not the same epistemics as taking all the knowledge we have about something that we have a lot of knowledge and just adding knowledge to it. So that's a... I just, I just want to ask about hydroxychloroquine because, as you say, there's been a lot of controversy about it. It's become kind of a little bit of a political football. But at the same time, there are, um, I feel, kind of the need to, to, to push back a little bit because there have been sort of concerns about um, it's used for a lot of other treatments at the moment and there's potential shortages because of people getting very excited about its use for COVID-19. And from what I've... I mean, I sent you a couple of articles from the Washington Post just before we started recording and the kind of the what is kind of generally accepted or, or the narrative that's that's out there mostly is that it's not uh, the evidence is not good, um, that the initial trial showing that there was some um, usefulness in it have not been positive or that there were major flaws in those trials. So I'm kind of I'm concerned about putting something out there that might kind of add to that. Um, that, that we haven't kind of, we're not all able to completely check. So what's your sense of what the narratives are and what the, the truth is? Well, fortunately, it's a prescription medicine, so you can't just get it on your own. Your doctor, you'd have to talk to a doctor and they have the job to review this and make the decision. So I'm not going to advise anyone, any medical advice. I'm not offering medical advice. Uh, I would say talk to your doctor about it. But if you want to talk to your doctor and be well-informed, do your own information searching. But if you know that this is a highly politicized topic and that there are articles that are radically different on this particular thing, then to actually make sense of it is going to take a little bit deeper work. So I'll tell you how I make sense of it. And my sense-making is almost certain to increase on this particular topic as the days and weeks follow and more information comes up. So is it a benign drug? No, there's totally contraindications and risks and nobody should be drinking fish tank cleaner. Like, um, and if you just happen to find some hydroxychloroquine somehow or chloroquine, by the way, those two are quite different. Hydroxychloroquine has a much lower side effect profile. And so any study that is comparing those two as if they're the same thing, that is also inappropriate. Um, but uh, are there concerns for people with specific kinds of heart issues that it elongates this QTC interval? Yes. So you would want to see your doctor. They would look at the contra indications of what not to do, what not to give it with in terms of other drugs you're on or existing medical conditions, maybe do an EKG and then decide if you seem like a safe person to do it with where the benefits of doing it outweigh the possible risks of doing it. And that kind of um, uh, risk to benefit assessment is a key to using a medicine. Uh, with regard to shortage in supply, so if we look at the food supply system right now, we see that there are areas where farmers are tilling crop back into the soil, potatoes are rotting because no, because McDonald's isn't feeding people so they aren't buying French fry materials and dairy is being dumped in huge amounts. And so it's like there's food wastage happening because of food excesses 
because the normal distribution channels, which are stores that aren't selling it, uh, restaurants that aren't selling it. But at the same time, there are people who are starving in place of in India where they can't get food. And you see these lines in San Antonio of cars that are a mile long waiting for food lines. It's not that there isn't enough food or that there's too much food. There's actually an intelligence issue, right? A logistics issue of getting the stuff from where it is to where it needs to go. The same has been true with PPE, where it's like there have been huge national stockpiles of PPE and in other places, and it just hasn't for whatever set of reasons got where it needs to go. It's the best of my understanding that that's the case with the hydroxychloroquine. That there are both meaningful existing stockpiles and a lot of places that are up ramping their capability to produce it because it's an extremely simple molecule. And being that it's generic, any lab that wants to start to make it, it could start to make it. I mean, they would need FDA approval if they're in the US. They obviously would need something different if they're in the developing world, which is one of the nice things is being able to have something that is actually producible for large population developing world type places. Um, so one of the things we did was, uh, so there was this, there was a Chinese study and there were questions about the validity of the Chinese study. There were two Chinese studies actually. Then there was this French study that got a lot of news and there were questions about the appropriateness of the methodology on the French study. Then there was this uh, New York doctor, uh, Zelenko, who did it. And, uh, you know, he was claiming near pretty close to perfect results. And there were questions about his methodology. And then there were more people that started claiming that they were having success using it. So uh, we just brought a few MDs together who understood the pharmacology of the drug, did a review of all the literature, and then called all the doctors we could find who had been using it in this country and in other countries, and especially doing early treatment and said, just give us all your data. So what, how many people did you treat? What were they presenting with? What kinds of diagnostics did you do up front? And then what have you seen in terms of progression to severe cases and like that? This is not randomized. Uh, this is not placebo controlled, double or single blinded. Uh, it is multi-location if you factor the aggregate data. Now, does it mean anything? Could those all be placebos? Well, we could look at the total effect that placebos, the range of effect that placebos have for similar viral conditions, because placebos don't have 100% success, right? They have a specific range of success where you can remove that statistical artifact and see, is there an effect beyond the type of effect placebos typically have? Um, especially when you see that there are mechanistic effects and in vitro effects and, you know, uh, in vivo on other types of viruses. And, um, so a pretty large number of doctors said that the people that they had been treating early on who were presenting with uh, COVID-19, uh, that the percentage of those people that progressed to needing hospitalized was about 70% less on average across them than the average background rate of what's assumed to be the number of infections that progress to needing hospitalization. Now there's questions regarding if the average background rate is correct. And if just simply seeing a doctor and calming the person's mind was a part of that, there's all kinds of questions, but that's not meaningless data. It's not a randomized control trial, but it's not meaningless data. Um, so the proposal that we suggest that I, I would suggest here is that A, a emergency provision be put in place. I would like the FDA to do this. I don't know if it's uh, possible that prescribing physicians are allowed to treat at will with the best of the data currently available to them, where specifically what the law would be doing is having the hospital system they work for and or the malpractice insurance actually protect them. And so that's not just with the use of hydroxychloroquine. It would also be as information comes out on ivermectin or methylene plu or the PDE inhibitors or the cytokine storm modulators or the, um, I have heard a number of doctors say that their hospital complex said that they would be fired if they prescribed hydroxychloroquine, even though they believed that they should in cases. I'm not telling anyone they should go treat themselves. I'm saying that the doctor should have the ability 
to be exposed to all the literature that's currently there and be empowered to follow their Hippocratic Oath and save lives as best as possible in lieu of real data, in lieu of adequate data, because not, not adequate, in lieu of idealized data. This is basically saying epistemics in wartime are different than they are in peacetime. And randomized control trial is not the only epistemic tool in the whole universe. And um, there is an ethics to inaction. So if inaction means I know this percentage of these people are going to go to advanced cases and die, and these are people who have comorbidities and increased risk and whatever, then there's a very real need to say, do we have enough data to say that it is a right choice, that the risk benefit is worth this? And that would be a decision between the doctor and the patient. I do believe that during this time, rather than only allow FDA approved things, uh, doctors should be able to treat at will. And, you know, there, one could say from an FDA perspective, they're allowed, but not from a malpractice or a hospital perspective often. And that's going to be the key thing that we would want the state to legislate in the uh, support of. And I, I wonder, you mentioned the second and third order effects, and you talked about a lot of those in the last film that we put out. Are you seeing any of those? Well, we already mentioned some of them, right? Like talking about the food supply. So the, the huge number of locusts that are in parts of Northern Africa and uh, parts of the Middle East, they, the locusts were already there before the COVID thing happened, but they got much, much worse. I, I don't know the specific stats on how much worse than recent infestations, but it's definitely the biggest thing in recent times and destroyed crops in those areas. That was actually because of um, travel bans that kept the pesticides from getting to the farmers. And so because they couldn't get the pesticides, they couldn't treat for the pests. And because they were you know, doing agriculture that's very susceptible to pests, then they were all able to uh, be devastated. Um, there were similar kinds of things that happened in India that led to uh, crops rotting in fields. And so we have this over demand and under demand supply chain set of issues where we have both rotting food, damaged food supplies, and people with no access to food simultaneously. And we're just at the beginning of those effects starting to happen. But those effects don't go away very quickly, right? Like if you lose a crop, that's going to have some enduring effect. And then you start getting uh, manipulation on the price of food commodities. So could there be escalation to food riots or wars over food shortages in areas where people don't have food? Like those are very real things. And especially when you look at a place like India, where the total number of people that could be in food shortage is a huge number of people, then does that lead to violence? Does that cleave along Muslim Hindu lines? Could that escalate to India-Pakistan issues? So this is where we're looking at an issue where you've already got systemic fragility. And you've already got basically a situation primed for uh, catalysis types events where, you know, the, the financial system pretty much broke, right? The economy uh, is extraordinarily damaged. The uh, social fabric has been very damaged in lots of areas. We aren't talking about this very much, but... Um, in addition to the mental health crisis that's happening from people being at home and not able to take care of their mind in the way they're used to in the increased anxiety, do we start seeing uh, benzo prescriptions go way up that'll also have a long tail of the damaging effects of the benzo prescriptions? Are we seeing increased domestic violence, both uh, spousally and towards children as people are in proximity with each other that they aren't used to having? And, and then what are the long tail societal effects of that trauma that occurs? right? Um, obviously, it's, it doesn't take very long to destroy a small business. It takes a pretty long time to rebuild an effective small business. And it's like cutting down an old growth forest. It, you just don't get one back very quickly. Um, and so the damage to uh, basically the unemployment, and we've seen what the unemployment just complete skyrocket 10x plus any previous you know, similar time period. Um, 
people don't get to refine jobs as quickly as they lost them or rebuild businesses. Or so there are enduring effects there. Obviously, if surveillance apparatus is put in of the wrong type, there are very enduring effects. Um, so I think that, and then you also have things like the, you know, the nature of alliances and geopolitical tensions has already changed the world and it's just not all realized yet. But the EU is already in a very vulnerable position for lots of reasons. And this was just on the tails of Brexit. And then having some countries get hit so hard and not receive EU support from other countries that got hit much less hard because they used their own resources, but they didn't feel like they had enough resource to help the other ones. What does that do to the EU and then specifically, how do other state actors that have very strong agendas with regard to what happens, how does Russia play that situation to get Baltic alliances back? And how does China play it to be able to advance Belt and Road initiatives? Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.